No, so good in morning. Copenhagen. Good morning, good afternoon, good morning. everybody. Good evening, wherever you might mm -hmm. be. It is my pleasure to welcome uh, Magnus Goffen from Sweden. I hope that's close enough. <laughs> and he will untwist spectral triples for us. So what was twisted will become logarithmically untwisted and it's all yours, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation to give this talk. It's uh, really nice to, to be here in uh, my home. Uh, so <laughs> I will talk about uh, Untwisting twisted spectral triples. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Bra Meslin, who's who is in, in the audience. Yes, complain, and uh, Adam Rennie, who it's not here, so he can't complain. Uh, and some of it might even be joint with uh, some other people too, uh, but they will appear along the way. So, <clears throat> oh shit, this is not how I wanted this to work out. Uh, let's see. So I can't use that for that. Okay. No, and I can't use that for that either. Let's see. Here we go. Uh, so this is the plan for the talk. Uh, I'm going to give some examples first of spectral triples just to sort of set the stage and uh, exemplify what we want to do. And then I'll talk about this thing that we called logarithmic dampening, which is how we untwist twisted spectral triples. Then I'll give some examples, uh, some more examples at the end. Uh, is there supposed to be a break somewhere, or is it just no, no. me we, talking we for an break. hour and a half? Yeah, one hour and a half. Okay. And then we all go for dinner. Good times. Uh, so I'm going to start with a really simple example. It's uh, really my favorite example because it's uh, very symmetric, and you can do a lot of computations with it. So it's just a Dirac operator on the circle. So if you haven't by chance not seen the spectral triple before, you can take this as the prototypical example. So we have a unital star subalgebra with the bounded operators on this Hilbert space H. So just smooth functions acting by pointwise multiplication. We have a self-adjoint operator, which is just the Dirac operator. So on the circle, we have a very nice ortho orthonormal basis uh, given by just each of the i and theta. Uh, and our Dirac operator is diagonal on this basis. Uh, I should also point out that as a rule, uh, we will identify 2 pi with 1 throughout the entire talk. Just so you know. Uh, it's it's so precisely because of such equalities that I marked our seminar as not appropriate for children. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you missing H bar some, somewhere. Should be uh, H bar equal to one, shouldn't it? H bar is, is always equal to one for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Richard, H bar equals C equal four pi equal one. Okay, right. accept it. Uh, we have a domain of this uh, self adjoint operator. Uh, it's just the first sub low space. Uh, L2 functions with an L2 derivative. And uh, then uh, we also have that the resolvent of this Dirac operator is compact. And this is just because the domain inclusion is a compact operator. And uh, we have some compatibility between the algebra and the operator, which is just that the functions preserve the domain of the self adjoint operator. And there's a commutator condition, which is a saying that the commutator between the Dirac operator and elements of the star algebra, a priori defined on the domain, extends to bounded operators on the entire Hilbert space. So there's sort of quite little wiggle room in this type of definition uh, of a spectral triple in order to obtain something like index theory. To get a K-Molgy class, there's quite little wiggle room uh, going on. Roughly, you can relax the, the domain preservation condition to an equivalent condition, saying something that the algebra preserves a core for the self adjoint operator D. Um, we'll see that in some of the examples. Uh, okay. So let's boot this example up a bit. And uh, no, let's, sorry, uh, let's talk about a, a, an interesting invariant that. Uh, I don't think has received the attention it deserves. 
uh, and this is um, concerned finitely summable special triples. Uh, so if we have a special triple, so it's something along the lines we saw on the previous slide, uh, we say it's finitely summable if the resolvent is not just compact, but it's actually in the pth Shatten class. So uh, the resolvent has the property that the absolute value to the power of p uh, has a finite trace. So it's saying something about how fast the eigenvalues of d grows, which should grow uh, faster than k to the one on p as k, k goes to infinity, the kth eigenvalue, that is. Uh, and this property is relating to dimension because the eigenvalues of d growth roughly like uh, the kth eigenvalue behaves roughly like k to the one on the dimension. So uh, the p that shows up here is in geometric examples, uh, some number bigger than the dimension. And this is in non-commutative geometry, you use finite summability for index theoretical constructions. So for instance, the common turn character, or you uh, need something even better than this to do local index theory as in Conmos Capici. Okay. And I should also add, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask them at any point. Uh, let's just write straight A for the C-star closure of this curly A appearing in the special triple. And then there's a really nice construction by Kohn uh, that if you have a finitely summable special triple, you can from this construct explicit tracial states. And the construction is roughly that you take the trace against a suitable power of D, a suitable negative power. And if you, know, if you take a large enough negative, uh, if you take uh, a negative enough power, uh, you have something which is trace class, so it's a finite trace, and then you sort of get uh, to a critical point. So uh, I realize now this is a bit sloppy, so um, this should not really be P, this should probably be a P0, where P0 is the uh, infimum of all the possible P's for which uh, it is P summable. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, what's interesting about this theorem of Kohn is that if you have a C star algebra that doesn't have any traces whatsoever, then it's simply impossible to have a spectral triple which is finitely summable on it. So, this is a, an obstruction to uh, C star algebras allowing for finitely summable spectral triples. Uh, but let's do a constructive example, again, with a circle, uh, is that if you compute these type of invariants showing up, uh, it's rather, it's, it's a really short computation with Fourier series to see that the trace that you get out of this is simply the, the usual Ramanian integral. So you get the Lebesgue integral against the Ramanian volume measure. Okay. So, and this is a sort of a slightly lengthier argument shows that this is what happens also for a general Dirac type operator on a compact manifold. So these type of invariants just reproduce the Ramanian integral. Okay. Uh, let's do a slightly more uh, complicated example. So uh, again on the circle, but now we involve a discrete subgroup of SU11. So you can also do SL2R because it's the same. Uh, <clears throat> so SU11 acts by Möbius transformations on the circle. It's a could be a potentially wild action. It rarely preserves the measure. So it's there are very few elements of SU11 that preserves the measure. So it's sort of there's something going on here. I mean, for instance, uh, if it were to play nicely with the spectral triple, we know from this construction of Kohn that it should actually preserve the measure. And if it doesn't, something is is wrong. And um, what, what we do have more precisely is that the Lebesgue integral is, does not sort of induce a trace on the cross product, but it defines a twisted trace. So if we just sort of lift up the uh, Lebesgue integral to uh, a state on the cross product, it has a, a twisted tracial property with respect to uh, 
an automorphism of a dense subalgebra. Okay, so this automorphism is actually not defined on the whole reduced cross product, it's just defined densely. It relates heavily to uh, KMS state, so you can define a certain uh, action of the real numbers on this cross product, and it will this integral against Lebesgue measure will be a, a KMS state. Mm, excuse me. So, uh, what is uh, gamma prime on the right hand side of this equality? Yeah. So let me explain that. So if we view gamma as a self diffeomorphism of the unit interval, it's really just the derivative of this as a function from the unit interval to itself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So prime means derivative. Prime really means derivative, yeah. Wow, Sorry. okay. Yeah. Great. Right. Uh, and uh, this cross product is uh, under some geometric assumptions like gamma being non-elementary and Foxian of the first kind. This cross product is, doesn't have any traces. It will be a purely infinite C-star algebra. It's even simple. Uh, it's even isomorphic to a nice conscrew algebra. So there are no traces. So there's really no chance of extending this uh, spectral triple to this cross product without doing an alteration that affects finite summability. So you really have to uh, take a sledgehammer to the Dirac operator to kill finite summability. You need to do a dramatic change. Okay. Uh, but the action is quasi-invariant, uh, which means that it preserves the, uh, the measure class. So it's, uh, if you pull back the measure along the action, it gives you a, a measure that's absolutely uh, continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And you can use this to define the unitary action of the cross product on L2 on the circle, which is just, you do pull back, but you also correct by the rather negative derivative, which coincides with uh, more or less the, uh, the the derivative, okay? And this example is, is looked at in a paper by Kona Moscovici, which is called type three in spectral triples. Uh, and they make this observation that if you take a twisted commutator with this action, uh, twisted by exactly the, the automorphism, then you actually have a bounded twisted commutator. So if you correct by this, um, term coming from the quasi-invariance, you, you get something bounded. It's not a commutator in this classical sense, but it's twisted commutator, it's bounded. Okay. Uh, right, and let me also mention that if you wanna see more about this example, you should really look in Kona Moscovici's paper. Okay. Uh, I, I really want to center on the examples here so we, we understand what's going on before we go to the formal definitions. I'm keeping things rather elementary uh, to start with. Uh, yeah. So if, you're, uh, if you've seen this before, then uh, you can do something else in the meantime. Uh, I want to look at another example, which is, in a sense, it's more simplistic than... Uh, an action by Mavis transformation. And this is, if we relax that it's a, it's a homeomorphism and just require that it's a local homeomorphism, even local diffeomorphism, uh, we can get some interesting examples. So one natural local diffeomorphism on the circle is if you just take the, the square as a complex number. So if you identify the circle with the quotient of the unit interval, this is multiplication by two. Uh, Pulling back by this gives us an isometry. And what it does in the Fourier basis is simply that it takes the Fourier basis with index n and maps it to the one with 2n. So it sort of stretches the Fourier basis. OK. Uh, and if it's, it plays rather nicely with multiplication by functions, uh, it's not a unitary, so it doesn't play as nicely as it would if it was an invertible map. Uh, but it plays rather nicely with this. If you conjugate by V, so V A V star is more or less the same as pulling back along G. And if you do it uh, in the other order, V star A V, then you get the push forward along G. So just integration along the fiber. So if you look at the star subalgebra of the bound operators generated by the smooth functions in V, let's call this A. 
And this is actually a rather, generates a rather interesting C stroke algebra. Uh, so, oh, should, um, this is actually the stable rel algebra of a small space that you construct from this map. So you take the solenoid of this map. So you look at uh, infinite sequences of points in S1. And as you go up, you're picking pre-images under the map G. Uh, this defines a small space and you can define different c stroh algebras from small spaces. And if you do the stable rel algebra, you end up with exactly uh, the c stroh closure of this uh, curly A. There's a U1 action and the fixed point algebra is a blunt steadiness algebra of a certain type. So this is rather easy to describe. Um, and one should note here that because this map G has a certain property called the mixing property, uh, there are no traces on the stable rel algebra. So in this case, it's even going to be a simple and purely infinite c stroh algebra again. So there's no chance of finding some of Let's just look at how this is visible at the level of the spectral triples. So Again, computing in this Fourier basis, we can do everything very explicitly. The uh, geometry here is doing very simple things to the basis. So we can see that if we take D, V, in that order, it's just two times VD. So we're really seeing this rescaling property uh, that we saw slightly in the, in the example of Mebius transformations where we saw it manifest in the fact that the twisted commutators are bounded. Here we're seeing it really on the nose at the level of the Fourier basis. Okay. So again, we can simply just define an, an automorphism of the star algebra by just sort of stretching. Like if a V, you stretch by two, then you automatically build in a, a bounded twisted commutator property. So we have the bounded twisted commutator property again, that D times the algebra element minus alpha on the algebra element times D is bounded or extends to a boundary operator. Okay. So now we've seen a few examples. So let's go to the formal definition. Yes. Uh, Sorry, Magnus, could you yeah. still go back uh, to the sure. previous slide? Uh, is there some magic related to the number two or did you choose it just to focus attention and any positive natural number an integer would do? You, you can go very deep into numerology, numerological speculations, but basically two is uh, the derivative of G. Yeah, 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 of course, that's what I have in mind. Yeah, but yeah. can you choose G where that, that it would be, uh, the derivative would be N and everything would be just replacing two by N at an appropriate place? Yeah, if you were here to put say uh, K, then uh, this would mm -hmm. be a K. Exactly. And that would be a K. And, and everything yeah, yeah. would work just as well. Yeah. Okay. It's really and, the same. And alpha is an action on, on what? So alpha is an automorphism of this curly A. All oh, right, which is this, uh, this algebra. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and, formally, and... it's really the same as the one we saw on the previous slide. Yeah. Like it's really just multiplying the, the derivative. But that's what you mean by saying it carries a U1 action. So that's. Uh, the, the, yes, this is, uh, yeah, that's a good point that the U1 action here is really relating to this alpha. Okay. Uh, in that it's, uh, alpha is uh, a holomorphic extension of this U1 action to an imaginary number. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. No worries. Uh, we will do a slightly more elaborate example just where here, some of the structure disappears into the explicitness of the construction, but uh, we'll see a, a more, uh, another example later on. Are there any more questions? Okay. So the formal definition that Karl Moscovici gave a twist the spectral triple is that you start with a star subalgebra as before uh, you also pick an automorphism of A. It should satisfy that uh, it's not a star automorphism, uh, but if you apply the star, it basically just inverts the automorphism. Uh, and oh, maybe I should actually point this out. Something to keep in mind here is that if alpha of A is equal to delta A delta inverse for some operator delta, possibly unbounded, 
um, then that the condition here is roughly the same as saying that delta is positive. So it's conjugation by positive element. Uh, this condition is going to simplify certain things, but it's not crucial. See. Um, D is now, again, it's going to be a self-adjoint operator with compact resolvent and the algebra preserves the domain. Again, this is hard to get out of. Uh, but now the twisted commentator is required to extend to a bounded operator. So if alpha is the identity automorphism, then we get back into the ordinary class of uh, spectral triples. Uh, there's also a technical condition that shows up, uh, which we will use. It's uh, called Lipschitz regularity. I'm saying that it's not just the twisted commutator with D that's bounded, but also the twisted commutator with the absolute value of D that is required to be a bounded operator. So that we call Lipschitz regularity. Okay. And uh, let's just remark here that if we define this operator F, which is D times the inverse of the absolute value, and we take an A in the algebra, then we can write the commutator with F in terms of twisted commutators with D and twisted commutators with the absolute value. And then there's a, an important inverse of the absolute value D. I'm here assuming D is invertible. If not, you can do some tricks to get out of that assumption. But it shows how we use Lipschitz regularity. It's, it's saying that if we have something Lipschitz regular, regular the commutator with F is a compact operator. So this gives a cycle for Kasparov's K-homology. So they're uh, Lipschitz regular twisted spectral triples. They carry index theory in the sense that they define a K-homology class. Marcus, if I may just completely naive question. I'm having problems imagining the situation in which this twisted commutator extends, but uh, its absolute value doesn't. Uh, so, so that Lipschitz regularity is really a condition. Can you give me some, okay, of course it must be related to the negative part of a spectrum of D, but can you give me some childlike uh, simple example I can hold on to see that uh, you have the extension of, a, of this bounded, uh, to, I mean of a twisted commutator, but not of uh, the absolute value? Um, At least an idea where to look for. Not on the top of my head, no. Okay. I mean, okay. It, it, I'm sure you can cook something up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I couldn't do it with the on twist. the top of my head, yes. No. I mean, especially with the twist. That's sort of the key feature that the twist really allows for some extremely esoteric examples. Okay, but I, I understand that this property even for twist being trivial, so for the usual commutator, there's still a difference uh, whether you take the absolute value or 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 the drag operator itself. Yeah, uh, I mean, you would have to cook something up there too, that's a bit, I, I would expect that you need something uh, slightly um, more elaborate in twisted case to yeah. find a funny counter example. Okay. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, um, okay. So, and the observation of Conan Moscovich is that if you have Lipschitz regularity, then you get a K-homology class. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, now let's speculate a bit uh, because there are some smoking guns here of how to treat uh, twisted spectral triples. So if we go back to the circle, 
and we look at a local diffeomorphism, we define this operator T phi as just pulling back along phi. If we start with a pseudo differential operator A, so this is defined from a symbol sigma, satisfying some estimates. If you haven't seen pseudos before, um, you can really think of a differential operator. Um, but the point is that you can, what you want to do is you want to compare A conjugated by T phi with A. That's very much related to the commutator of A with T phi. Here, T phi is, is not invertible, but locally you can invert it. So uh, for pseudo differential operator, there's sort of only local properties that matter. So we look at this locally where it makes sense. Uh, then the point is if you conjugate the pseudo differential operator by this uh, local diffeomorphism, it can be written as an operator in the same form, but the symbol changes along this rule. So you're changing the symbol by X being pulled back along phi and in the xi variable, you are uh, multiplying with the inverse of the derivative. And then there's a lot of low order terms that you have to take into account to get the full operator. But the leading behavior is what's going on here. Okay. So what this is sort of indicating is that if you take the logarithm of the absolute value, then altering this by conjugation by a local diffeomorphism will not change the leading order of behavior because the logarithm has the very amazing feature that we teach our first year students. It's that it converts multiplication into addition, right? So if we multiply the Xi by the phi prime, it just sort of goes out of the logarithm and we can throw it into the low order terms because it doesn't have any growth in Xi. So the logarithm of Xi will go to infinity as Xi goes to infinity. If we multiply this, this Xi by some number, that leading behavior will not change. Okay. Another sort of smoking gun that, uh, led to the ideas that we will talk about it is a certain hyper singular integral operator on the circle. So you can just simply define an, an integral operator by convolution by uh, the distribution one on the absolute value z. So here we're thinking of everything as being in the complex numbers. Okay, One on the absolute value z is not really distribution, you have to extend it over zero. And this is what we do with this finite part. It's a specific choice of extension. Uh, this is an integral operator. It's even a pseudo differential operator. Uh, the point is that it's equivariant for a certain unitized action of SU11. So it sort of plays nicely with these Mervius transformations. It, that's not the case for the Dirac operator, as we saw. It can be made the case for the uh, the phase of the Dirac operator, but here we have something in between. The reason we have something in between is, is uh, that sort of a first year graduate course in harmonic analysis will tell you that this is not something you want to work with. This is not even a bounded operator. And the reason for that is that this is a pseudo differential operator. It's not a classical one, so it doesn't have a polyhomogeneous expansion, but it still has a fairly nice symbol. And the symbol is exactly the logarithm. Okay. Uh, if you, you can really sit down with the Fourier transform and see why uh, the symbol of this operator should be the logarithm of xi. And it has to do with that. If you just look at the distribution one on x on the real line, you extend it over zero, say by uh, taking the finite part of it. The Fourier transform of this is uh, a multiple of the logarithm of xi. Uh, plus uh, some other multiple of the delta function at zero. Okay, and that is just some homogeneity consideration. So you take the uh, Fourier transform of something that's almost homogeneous up to a constant, sorry, up to delta. Uh, and here I'm talking about Bish actually, that's not a delta, it's just a constant. So the Fourier transform of something which is multiple of something homogeneous of order minus one up to a delta function. Well, then automatically we'll have to be homogeneous 
of order zero up to a constant. That means exactly the logarithm. Uh, in particular, this hypersingle integral operator will differ from the logarithm of the Laplacian on the circle by a compact operator. Okay. So the reason I bring this up was that it, this was pivotal in, in uh, the construction. So this was a question asked to me by Bogdan Nika about he found this uh, funny operator on the circle that was uh, equivariant. And he started asking questions about this. And then I realized this is just the logarithm of the Laplacian. And this is what led us to um, looking at this particular function. I'm going to call it the signed logarithm. And so it's just you take, uh, if you have a real number of xi, you uh, map it to this the sine of psi, so it's plus one if psi is positive, it's minus one if psi is negative. And then you multiply with the logarithm of one plus epsilon psi. So uh, we don't have to bother about setting a value for the sine of zero because the logarithm of one is zero. This is actually even a continuously differentiable function. Uh, its derivative is one plus the epsilon psi to the inverse and its value at zero zero, right? This is a continuously differentiable function. The derivative goes to zero at infinity, okay? This is a rather peculiar feature that you have a function whose derivative goes to zero at infinity, but, it, and it goes even like one on psi, but the primitive function is still an unbounded function going to infinity at infinity. So this is a, a as a meteorologist would call it, it's the perfect storm here. Like we have a really nice function here. It goes to infinity at infinity, but its derivative goes really fast to zero. It even has some Hermander estimates. And by this, I simply mean that you can bound the function by, by any positive power of psi. But if you, as soon as you take k derivatives uh, for positive k, it will go like psi to the minus k to zero at infinity. So we have a proper function and it differentiates as a zero order Hermandor symbol. And I, I mean, Hermandor symbol is the kind of things you would put into pseudo differential calculus. So this is kind of saying that we have a, a proper function. So it goes to infinity at infinity, but it walks and talks like a bounded function. Okay, so it has all the best features of a bounded function and an unbounded function. So uh, what sort of says that this is a very, uh, this is very close to what we want, uh, it will even be exactly what we want, is that if you sort of do rescaling in Xi by a positive lambda, uh, it will not change the value of this function except to something going very fast to zero at infinity. Okay. These are the type of, of uh, features you will see. This is sort of what happens to symbols when you uh, conjugate by a, uh, a local diffeomorphism on the circle. Okay. So uh, we're going to define the logarithmic dampening of a self-adjoint operator to just be functional calculus on that self-adjoint operator with a signed logarithm function. Okay. And we have that uh, any power of d, the domain of that will be a core for the signed logarithm of d. So this means that uh, in the domain of the, the sine logarithm, there's a, a space which is dense in the whole Hilbert space. And it's also dense in the domain of the sine logarithm in the graph norm. So roughly most of the things we want to do here for the domain of the, wait, sorry, my pen died. Um, most of the things we want to do for this for this logarithmic dampening, uh, we can very often just assume that the vectors we're applying this to uh, are in the domain of a positive power of d. And since the sine logarithm is a proper function, the my pen has died. Uh, no, wait. Um, so let's see if this works. No, my pen is died. Okay. Anywho, um, 
this logarithmic dampen operator has compact resolvement as soon as d hat because of the properness of the sine logarithm. And what we will see next is that these type of Hermann underestimates, right? This is a first derivative of the sine logarithm goes fast to zero. This will then relate to how commutators will behave. Okay. And the theorem now is that if you have a Lipschitz regular twist with respect to triple, then you can do the logarithmic dampening on the operator and get a Lipschitz regular spectral triple that represents the same k-homology class. So we're not changing the k-homology. What we are doing is that we're really taking the sledgehammer to the operator d and crushing down the growth of the eigenvalues. So if something would grow uh, in a finitely summable way, it will all of a sudden grow like a logarithm. And this manifests in that if you have a finitely summable twisted spectral triple, then the logarithmic dampening is exponentially summable. So the trace of, uh, of e to the minus t times the absolute value is finite for large enough t. Okay. So are there any questions? Yeah, hi, Manos. It's Ludwig. Hi. So hi. this. Hammer, this doesn't depend on alpha automorphisms at all. No. It's a universal hammer. It, it's a universal hammer. It doesn't see alpha. Alpha just has to exist. Okay. And and um, I will get back to this in the following comments. Uh, okay. So if I may also ask, ask a question. So it doesn't depend on, on alpha in any way. So if you start with a spectral triple, then which, which is finitely summable, then you can apply it and get a D log for just a usual spectral triple, right? Yeah, yeah. And this will, of course, I mean, this will be only exponentially summable, but still will be a spectral triple giving you the same K homology class. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. If time permits, I'll even give you an example where we, where this was necessary to apply to uh, an ordinary spectral triple mm -hmm. uh, for uh, some Casper products. Very good. Okay, so uh, let me also comment that we're not even using that alpha as an automorphism of A. It just needs to be a, a partially defined monomorphism defined on the curly A. So it doesn't even have to be preserve the algebra. Uh, we call these things weakly twisted spectral triples when it's the alpha doesn't preserve the algebra. Okay. What is and, partially defined? Is science partially defined? Sorry? Which science partially defined on BH? It's only defined on uh, subspace of BH. Uh, and sub algebra. Okay. So it's defined, it's just some monomorphism on a subalgebra B of H that contains A. Okay. Uh, also, we don't even have to start with a twisted spectral triple. We can start with a triple AHD, uh, but we need a requirement on the F, which is that, uh, so F is the, sign, the sign of D. If this F fulfills that uh, commutators with the F, maps the whole Hilbert space into the domain of D, then from this, we can define a weakly twisted spectral triple by just taking this uh, monomorphism alpha to just be conjugation by the absolute value of D. Sort of the condition that commutators with F maps into the domain is sufficient to guarantee bounded twisted commutators for this alpha sub absolute value of D. And uh, then doing logarithmic dampening on D will then produce a spectral triple. And in a sense, this is really what it all boils down to. The Lipschitz regularity is more or less saying that we can in fact assume that the, the automorphism is of this form, conjugation by the absolute value. Okay. Um, right. And let me also mention this result extends to weakly twisted Casper modules if you are so inclined uh, and let me just remark here that the sine logarithm is a continuous function, so it makes sense to apply this to a uh, Casper module. We can do functional calculus also on Hilbert modules. 
for continuous functions. Okay, well, and let me mention some ideas. Right. And sorry, Magnus, can you still go yeah. back and just? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm sorry, but you allowed to do it. So, um, I'm looking at this uh, second bullet here. Yeah. And I was wondering what would happen if you would throw in uh, after a spectral triple uh, p summable. What would be the statement? And if AHD is a p summable spectral triple such that blah blah blah, then what would be the conclusion? So a uh, HD log is a what kind of spectral triple if I would want to throw in this? So it's just exponentially summable. So just as, okay, that's actually what's it about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Except that here it was with, with an alpha. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but alpha. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks. No worries. Uh, let me. I will actually give sort of the ideas and the proof of this because the ideas are, are fairly straightforward. Um, so we will assume D is invertible. Uh, it's always possible to fudge around with the spectral triple and make sure it's invertible without changing uh, uh, anything vital. Uh, and what we need to prove is that if we have a, a bounded operator which preserves the domain as bounded twisted commutators uh, with D and the absolute value, then uh, the commutator with a slight variation of this D log as a bounded extension. So we're not proving this for the signed log, but we really have, uh, my pen is gone, uh, so I can't say this, but it's a log of the absolute value of D and not log of one plus the absolute value of D. We need invertibility to make sense of the logarithm in that case. Uh, we will see why we, we dropped the <clears throat> one. And uh, we're going to look at the operator t, which is just the logarithm of the absolute value of d, and then we multiply with the inverse of the absolute value of d. This commutator, which we know is defined on the domain of uh, d, it's even defined on the domain of the logarithm of d, uh, sort of a posteriori we can say that. A priori it's just defined on the domain of d because we don't know if A preserves the domain of the logarithm. Uh, so this, these computations are a priori happening on the domain D, which is a core. Sorry, a stupid core. question. Why is it uh, TD, not DT? Uh, they commute. Uh -huh. okay. Everything okay. commutes. Because the D is self adjoint so it commutes with okay. the okay. value and everything. Yeah, sorry, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we expand that commutator with TD into a twisted commutator with D and a twisted commutator with T. And uh, we expand it one step more. Uh, I mean, the, the, the precise expression for T is telling us that what we end up with is uh, some commutator with twisted commutator with D, a twisted commutator with the absolute value of D, and then there's a t factor in front of the first two terms. The t is bounded because it's functional calculus uh, with even a c0 function. So these t is even compact, a compact operator. Then there's the final term, which is the commutator with the logarithm of absolute value of d. So that's really what matters. Everything boils down here to the commutator with the logarithm of the absolute value of d. And this is, of course, assuming. Lipschitz regularity, because the second term here with the twisted commutator with the absolute value of D, we can't really get rid of that in any good way. So um, this is roughly what we said, that we reduce this uh, commutator property to proving that the commutator with the logarithm of D is bounded. And this uh, took us a while to figure out, a few years. Um, the point here is that the Lipschitz regularity assumption is guaranteeing that conjugating A by the absolute value of D from both sides produce operators with bounded extensions. Now, if we don't just conjugate by D, but we conjugate by, uh, by a, a complex power of the absolute value of D, we can bound this as when, re, when Z has real part minus one and real part plus one. When z is plus or minus one, this is just Lipschitz regularity. And if 
the just the real part is uh, plus or minus one. It's really just the same expression, but uh, times unitary operators on the sides. So we can bound this uh, when the real part of z is equal to plus or minus one. And then there's this amazing theorem of Hadamard uh, called the Hadamard three-line lemma or the Hadamard three-line theorem. It says that if you have a, a holomorphic function on a strip, you can bound it in the interior by, uh, by the values on the boundary. Okay, this is a priori not bounded as an operator value function, but if you apply it to functions of the domain, you can bound this in terms of the Hilbert space norm. So it's sort of, you can, boot up this to uh, uh, using a density argument, you can really show that this defines a bounded holomorphic function in Z. And that really clinches the deal because now the, the commutator with a logarithm, if you take closure of that, that's exactly gonna be the derivative of this function at Z equal to zero. So using boundedness on this strip, the, the, the derivative at zero will have to be a bounded function because it's a holomorphic expression. Um, and then the commutator is bounded. Okay. So it's really all coming from the Lipschitz regularity. And again, we're really not using the precise form of alpha. We can even assume that alpha is given by conjugation by this absolute value. Okay. So that uh, concludes the proof. Um, any questions? Okay. So, uh, so what? Why should we uh, really care about this type of result? Uh, I think this is interesting from the perspective that if we are trying to find a non commutative geometry on a C-star algebra, the, the result shows that there's no a priori preference for if we want to look for something twisted or if we want to look for some just ordinary uh, special triple. Um, it sort of, it seems to be an opinion that you, that uh, I came across some years ago was that for a certain type of sister algebra, the, the people would expect that um, if, if there were no traces, then you should go look for a twisted spectral triple. That would be the natural choice. Uh, but this result is showing that uh, there really is no natural choice. You can, if you have a twisted spectral triple, this will sort of give rise to a very canonical ordinary spectral triple. Uh, spectral triples are in a sense, um, they're logically easier to deal with because there's no twist. Uh, but I guess that Kohn Moscovich's example in the circle really shows that in that case, it's it's much more natural to work with a twisted one because the, the Dirac operator on the circle is a much nicer operator than its logarithmically damped operator because the Dirac operator is first order differential. If you apply logarithmic dampening, you do get an ordinary spectral triple, but you do it at the cost of having to deal with uh, a pseudo differential operator. Okay. We'll see some cases where, where it's sort of is not really uh, relevant to uh, have, I mean, where there are no differential operators, it, it might not even make sense to ask this. Um, also, uh, going back to, uh, slightly back to Piotr's question from before, is that if we have the right circumstances, we can actually invert logarithmic dampen. We can do an exponential twisting is that if we have a spectral triple with these magical properties that if you conjugate by e to the d, e to the absolute value d, it's again, uh, it has a bound extension. Also that the commutator with the f has a bound extension even after multiplying with e to the absolute value d. So these are extremely, um, extremely sort of strong assumptions to make. But if they're true, uh, you can uh, define a, a twist, I mean, a weak twist, not preserving the algebra necessarily, uh, by simply just conjugating by e to the absolute value of d. And this produces a weakly twisted spectral triple that represents the same k-multi class. Okay. 
And the assumptions are made so that this is automatically going to be Lipschitz regular. Uh, and you can also see here that if you start from something exponentially summable, you will exponentially twist it to something finitely summable. So this partially inverts logarithmic damping, but it's truly partially because these are extremely strong assumptions to make. Uh, we will see an example thereof later on. Um, the, one of the crucial properties is that when you look at this new operator, this exponential operator f times e to the f sub i d, the twisted commutator for this choice of twist is really just the exponential times the commutator with d, the ordinary commutator with, with the f, sorry. Uh, I guess the reason I bring this up is that we have examples where this, uh, where this happens and where it produces some interesting things. And it does so for Kunz-Krieger algebras where you can represent all elements of k-homology by spectral triples of that type. Uh, and it's even the case that this commutator with f is finite rank. So it's extremely regular with respect to the f, but with respect to the d, you're not really uh, getting as a regular behavior. Excuse me. Uh, so if you started with a spectral triple, then you will uh, make this dampening construction and then untwist again, you will end up with something uh, with the original one or not? Uh, so if you do that first logarithmic dampening and then exponential twisting, what will happen to a twisted spectral triple is that you're replacing the twist alpha by really conjugating by the absolute value. Mm. Ah, sure. This, okay. Okay. You end up with a twisted one. Yeah. So okay, this is a, a left inverse. Uh, the exponential twisting is a left inverse, except for the fact that it changes the twist to a weak twist. Mm -hmm. And I mean, looking exactly at this example of Kona Moscovici on the circle, the, the interesting thing there is that both the operator the Dirac operator and the twist are uh, geometrically relevant objects to look at. So in that case, it would really kill off uh, what makes the example interesting. So I would say this is an, an uh, a result that's sort of interesting for um, theoretical reasons. Uh, but then again, I mean, we are in non-commutative geometry. So this is a non-theory in the same way that nonlinear PD is. So it's not really built around some major theory, but rather around examples. So uh, therefore I think theoretical results that help to uh, build foundations can uh, be of importance. Okay. Uh, just another remark about when this is sort of not really a, a major Thing to do, Lord, wait, 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 Marcus, you had a very interesting sentence at the end of your previous slide and you didn't uh, pronounce it. So as how about Kunz-Krieger algebra? So that's... Oh, I mentioned that before. It was saying oh, that oh, if you have, uh, if you're looking at Kunz-Krieger algebra, uh, any element of K-homology can be represented by, by spectral triples satisfying these really, really strong assumptions. Mm -hmm. So any spectral triple on the Kunz-Krieger algebra is homotopic to one that you can exponentially twist. And when you say Kunz-Krieger uh, algebras instead of uh, graph sister algebras, which conditions do you assume on the graph? I guess it should, shouldn't should uh, have any sinks or, uh, or sources. Rho finite no. maybe? Oh, it's finite, sorry, finite Rho. graph. Finite graph. Okay. Finite graph, um, yeah. I would say that we, uh, in neither of these works, we've considered infinite graphs or uh, anything like that. Uh, yeah. There is some really nice work by Adam Rennie and Francesca Ricci on that goes in that direction. Uh, but I've never dealt with anything infinite in graphs. Uh, and it's uh, everything I do today will be for unital C true algebras. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, there's sort of um, when people construct spectral triples, sometimes they use the following method that they have some 
star algebra acting on the Hilbert space, and the Hilbert space is filtered, so it's exhausted by a, a sequence of uh, subspaces. And then you build a uh, speculative triple simply by requiring some uh, compatibility between the representation of, of A with the filtration. And then you build the operator D by just uh, taking projections onto the associated uh, grading, the graded subspaces coming from this filtration. And then you scale them up by some eigenvalues lambda K. Okay. So this can be seen in, in uh, the Yvonne Christensen construction uh, for AF algebras. And it's seen in uh, more or less in uh, constructions of spectral triples by uh, Bellasard and Pearson. So it's seen in, in numerous places, this type of construction. And if you are in such situations, there could be some type of geometric candidate for what the, what the eigenvalue should be, but it's rarely God given in a sense. And there's no uh, obvious choice. So logarithmic dampening, what that would do is just, it would just change the eigenvalues, it would uh, just apply a logarithm to it. Of course, taking care of science, things like that. So in the, those type of constructions, logarithmic dampening is not the worst. It's not gonna make a differential operator into a pseudo differential operator. It will just change one specific choice of eigenvalues to another choice of eigenvalues. Uh, let's get down to some more uh, elaborate examples. Um, this is in a spirit very similar to what we saw in the circle in the beginning of the talk. So if we have a discrete semigroup of uh, local diffeomorphism on a manifold M, let's assume the manifold is compact, let's assume there's a choice of Riemannian structure, and we will call the dimension of this manifold N. Uh, let's also choose a Clifford bundle on this. So this, if you're, if M has a spin C structure, for instance, you can take S to be the, the spinner bundle, um, but it can really be any Clifford bundle. So this means there's a Clifford action of the, of the cotangent vectors and it's, uh, satisfies the Clifford relations. And there's a choice of Hermitian metric, uh, Hermitian connection, Hermitian metric and so on. So this is really what you need to talk about Dirac operators. We don't really need to assume any specific structure, just a Clifford bundle. Then what we will assume is that the uh, this discrete semigroup acts conformally on the metric. So if we pull back the metric along a, an element of the semigroup, it just rescales the metric by a, a positive smooth function. And we will also assume that the action of the semigroup lifts the Clifford bundle in the sense that it lifts to a unitary Clifford linear morphism. Uh, so this will lift the semigroup action on the manifold to uh, something happening on the Clifford bundle. So if you think about what this means for the circle, it's really a, a rather um, a trivial construction because the Clifford, I mean, the, the we were looking at the spinner bundle there uh, and it, it uh, is a, just a trivial line bundle. So the lifts here are uh, trivial. Okay. Uh, now the algebraic cross product of the smooth functions by the semigroup. So I mean algebraic cross product in the sense that we just take the algebra generated by the smooth function and the semigroup satisfying uh, some uh, commutation relations. We can act on uh, L2 sections of the Clifford bundle in this way. So this V gamma is you pull back F along gamma, you apply this uh, Clifford linear morphism because F pull back by gamma will now be a section of the pullback of S along gamma. So you apply U gamma and you end up back in S. And then we multiply with a, a prefactor that makes sure that this is uh, an isometry, okay? And it really becomes an isometry because uh, gamma acts conformally on the metric. And the power n to the four here uh, comes up uh, because there's going to be an n divided by two coming from how gamma pulls back the volume form. And there's another half coming from the fact that you're 
making it into an isometry. And then you also need to divide by uh, the square root of the number of pre-images of a gamma. This is a locally constant function because gamma is a local homeomorphism. Okay. And uh, oh yeah, let me point out that if you do this for the circle and g of z being z square, we really just get back uh, the pullback. Okay. Um, then we have an automorphism of this cross product, which is that you uh, rescale each gamma by this uh, conformal factor. And for Dirac operator, it's sort of a bit of yoga with the definition of what we've done with the, uh, the lifts to just verify that if you conjugate the Dirac operator by these, by these isometries, it just rescales the principal symbol. So there's a lot of things happening with the low order terms in this, uh, in a, in the Dirac operator, but in the leading order term, it's just a rescaling, okay, which follows from Clifford linearity and the conformal, uh, the conformality of the action. And uh, so if we take the star algebra generated by this uh, type of object in the bounded operators, then roughly by the same type of computation as above, we get a twisted spectral triple. And it's finitely summable and the degree of finite summability is really the dimension. Okay. So this is slightly booted up from the example we saw in the circle. If gamma only consists of uh, diffeomorphisms, this is of course a group and uh, yeah, um, V gamma will be uh, unitary. Okay. Now, a uh, theorem of this is that if we do logarithmic dampening on this, we end up with an exponentially summable uh, spectral triple. Uh, I should warn you here, I used a d squared inside the logarithm here for reasons that uh, will become apparent soon. It really doesn't change anything uh, except a by a factor of two and a bound of perturbation. We know by the logarithm loss that we can move down to two and then you can do some uh, uh, perturbation theory on this. So it's roughly multiplication by two of what we saw before and a bounded uh, perturbation. Okay. And this spectral triple has some quite interesting features is that if you take operators T1 up to Tn in the algebra generated by this A and the differential operators, so anything you can get from the algebra and anything you get by uh, differential operators in there, uh, then he traces, but now with the absolute value in the exponent, this actually extends meromorphically in this uh, this pr uh, parameters t1 up to tn that you exponentiate by. And here is where I use the d squared inside the logarithm because if you exponentiate that ds log, uh, you really just end up with powers of one plus ds squared. And this statement really boils down to something uh, well known about zeta functions. So what is sort of happening here is that when we do a logarithmic dampening, we afterwards we have to look at heat traces and that will correspond to zeta functions in uh, the original uh, object. Okay. So it sort of shows somehow that after logarithmic dampening, the heat traces will play a similar role to the zeta functions did before. Uh, also, we can do a similar type of construction that we saw in um, in concentration obstruction is that if we, instead of taking traces of powers, negative powers of D, we take uh, heat operators, we can do a similar limit to this. We normalize this by, uh, uh, so that it becomes a state. And this functional turns out to, um, Really, it really, in a sense, defines a KMS state for a certain action. And the action is defined from uh, the conformal weights. But already at this stage, we can say that it's a twisted trace for this automorphism alpha that we saw before. What are periodic points? What do you mean oh. periodic? Uh, so I'm not sure if this is a necessary condition, but if we, if, when we sit down and compute this, uh, we need to discard all periodic points. 
at some point. It's really boils down to a lengthy computation with uh, these type of expressions. And the point is sort of when A is in this algebra, you have a lot of uh, um, different powers of, of, um, of roughly elements from uh, the group, the semi-group and their adjoints. And then you, um, you write up a lengthy expression and if you can discard periodic points, then uh, okay. Okay. that's everything that remains. I'm not sure this is a necessary condition. Um, yeah. And please remind me this uh, N is the dimension of our manifold, right? Exactly, yeah. And you don't care whether you approach it with T from above or below? Because I remember that in, in uh, Kahn's theorem, it was epsilon, which was positive, typically. Yeah, I, uh, I swept this completely under the rug while waiting for someone to ask about this. Uh, so it's not even um, necessarily, it doesn't have to be a limit. So we need to pick an extended limit as T goes to N from above. From above. Okay. Okay. Right. And uh, uh, now I notice the inverted commas around the limit. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But yeah, it's definitely from above. Yeah. Sorry. That was mm -hmm. a good point. And uh, let's just also point out that one can really prove this uh, theorem directly by pseudo differential calculus that it becomes suspected triple. Is, is something that you can prove using pseudo differential calculus in this case. You don't need to use uh, this abstract proof uh, that we saw above. And here there's a very nice calculus by Lesh for log polyhomogeneous symbols. So the logarithmically dampened operator is a log polyhomogeneous pseudo differential operator, not an ordinary polyhomogeneous or classical one. And there's in fact a very large class of functions that you can use to do the same thing with. You don't just, you can't just use the logarithm. You can use really any uh, function of regular variation. So it doesn't have to be the logarithm. So it can be the square root of the logarithm. It can be the power of the logarithm. It can be a lot of different things. Excuse and, me. Yeah. May I ask a question? Go nuts. Uh, so, so, yeah. So what uh, information is captured in the singularities of this uh, meromorphic extension? Is this uh, something like a dimension spectrum for a spectral triple? Or? It would be something like a dimension spectrum, yeah. I mean, it would not be the, the dimension spectrum of the nose because that would come from zeta functions and the zeta functions are not defined here because we don't have finite summability. Um, it would rather be the dimension spectrum of the twisted spectral triple that we start from. Yes, but uh, uh, this set is uh, two, two n dimensional uh, a priori. Okay, it's, it's contained in in c to the power two n. So, how do we understand this? Yeah. So uh, in several variables, yes, n variables. Yeah, I mean, I guess it would be along uh, hyperplanes. It would be something interesting, probably. Or I mean, along a along a complex line, mm -hmm. or if it's just uh, one operator. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh. Okay. Um, and there are some interesting things there that have not really been explored, and uh, using that for um, uh, in in this context, there are. Um, variations of Kahn's trace theorem that would compute singular traces. So if, if some operator here would appear that belongs to some nice ideal of uh, operators, um, I mean, uh, then computing singular trace of that is highly doable, um, more or less using the same type of formulas as in Kahn's trace theorem for Dixman traces. Uh, I, I didn't really want to go into that too much, but let me just say that there's some things to explore here. Okay. Uh, and let's look at a very specific case. Uh, this shows up for Wheeler uh, in a, a 
this shows up for certain smell spaces it's called Wheeler smell spaces. So in this case, the semigroup is just generated by one local diffeomorphism. And for to give a smell space, we need to assume this G is locally expanding. So this means that the derivative is an expansive uh, vector model homomorphism of Tm, roughly saying that all the eigenvalues of the derivative of G are have absolute value strictly bigger than one. So the power square that the 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 square that we saw on the circle has derivative two, so that is an expansive uh, local diffeomorphism. If uh, this is uh, the case, then we can define the solenoid. Uh, so it consists of uh, infinite paths of points in M, such that um, Y1 has a preimage that you've, you've chosen a preimage Y2, and then you choose a preimage for Y2 being Y3, and then you go on. So it's sort of a choice of preimages under this map G. This turns out to be a so-called smell space, and it has totally disconnected stable sets. The way this manifests is that uh, the space is a matchbox manifold. So if you just project onto the first coordinate, you get a locally trivial fiber bundle of Cantor sets. So this solenoid has some rather interesting features. And then it turns out that the Seastore algebra generated by this cross product is a stable real algebra of this uh, smell space X. So it's not just something happening on the circle, it's something that happens rather generally for uh, locally expanding local diffeomorphism that you get some type of smell space, some interesting dynamical system where you have uh, some various dynamically defined equivalence relations and uh, that give rise to some C structures. And if, uh, if G is so-called mixing, I mean, meaning that it moves around a lot of the space, then this uh, stable real algebra is purely infinite and simple. So it's, it usually produces something without traces. Can you the remind locally, us what stable uh, real algebra is? Uh, rather not. Uh, I just wanted to sort of indicate that this is something that, that shows up in smell spaces. That mm -hmm. I mean, this is giving rise to uh, well-studied C algebras. Mm -hmm. uh, it's roughly you define an equivalence relation on X. Mm -hmm. uh, that you sort of have, uh, there's a map on X, which is just shifting your space, mm -hmm. because if it's consisting of preimages, uh, it really lifts the map G up to X by just shifting the sequence. And then you have, uh, if you have two points, you can say that they're stable equivalent if they, uh, if they converge closer and closer once you go uh, far enough with the map, this shift map. You can mm -hmm. say they're unstable equivalent if they go closer and closer when you go backwards with a shift map. Mm -hmm. And then there's an equivalence relation coming from how you, uh, from basically saying that two points are equivalent if they're stable equivalent. And you can find a topology on that as a groupoid. And the groupoid C algebra of that is the stable algebra. It carries yes. an action of Z, and the cross product by Z is the stable real algebra. So mm -hmm. it's coming from the stable equivalence relation on this mail space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and now, uh, basically, because it's a stable real algebra, uh, there's also a kunz pimstrom exact sequence. You can think you can build these as uh, kunz pimstrom C-strom algebras, and then you can compute everything up with k homology going on. G. Um, uh, really determines all of the k-homology and k-theory of this uh, Seastro algebra, A. And the class that you get from these logarithmically dampened spectral triples, this gives you a class in the k-homology of this Seastro algebra A. And what that really boils down to is that it is a choice of pre-image under uh, the pullback map of the inclusion of functions on M into this c algebra A. Okay. So it's the logarithmically dampened operator really gives a preimage under the pullback. Okay. So it's a way to extend the spectral triple on functions on M up to this um, c algebra A. And 
this all together, it really pins down exactly how all of the k-homology of the c algebra can look. On the one hand, you have these logarithmically dampened thing coming from down on m. And then this, the remainder are things that are in the image of this boundary map from the k-homology on m. Okay, so we've chosen pre-images under i on the pullback of inclusion, and then the rest of the k-homology consists of things coming from the boundary map. That's been computed by um, it's computed by results with uh, Robin Dealey, Brom Esland, Mike Whitaker, uh, and also with Brom Esland and Adam Rennie. So it all boils down to um, that there is a very nice unbounded Casper module uh, for this algebra A with coefficients and functions on M and taking Casper products with K homology on M, we get everything. We combine this with these logarithmically dampened things. So um, we still have 15 minutes. Uh, and if there are any questions, you can ask them at any point. Okay. So I want to get back to some other examples, uh, a rather concrete one of that. Uh, we did not do that much work here, but we will use it later on in a, a specific context. So there were a class of spectral triples constructed by Bellasort and Pearson. So they started from a rooted tree, D, uh, and they defined a spectral triple on the boundary of this rooted tree. I will assume again that this, uh, it's, the, there's a uniform bound on how many branches each point in the tree has, even though I haven't written it up. The boundary now consists of paths going from the, the root in the tree out to infinity. So this is the, the boundary of this, uh, this rooted tree. And this boundary space is a compact metric space uh, and you can equip it with an ultrametric, which is defined by, taking the, by saying that the logarithm of the distance between two infinite paths is minus uh, the maximal length of a of, of a finite path, which is common for both infinite paths. So what this is saying, I mean, if you, if you would, for instance, to compute the distance between an infinite path and itself, any, any point along the way will be, a, 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 I mean, a finite path joined for a path and itself. So the supreme is infinite. So the distance will then be zero. But I mean, if you have two different paths, they will at some point they will go different ways. And you take that, that point, you see how far away is it from the root, root, and then you take e to the minus of that length, of that longest common path. Okay. Uh, in the Bellasart and Pearson construction of the spectral triple, they need a choice function. So this is simply a map from the rooted tree to its boundary. And what it does is that it takes a point of the tree, sends it to an infinite path that passes through itself. So C of E is an infinite path that goes through B. Um, and then you can start setting this spectral triple up. So the algebra consists of the Lipschitz functions on the boundary the Hilbert space or just the little L2 space of this rooted tree. Uh, and the operator will define soon. Uh, in the construction, you pick two choice functions. Uh, and the algebra, you embed it as bounded operators on this direct sum of little L2 spaces. By simply in the upper left corner, you put the pullback along the first choice function. And in the bottom right, you put the pullback along the other choice function. Um, to be precise, uh, Pearson, Bellasart and Pearson used actually the same choice functions, but that will produce a k-homologically trivial spectral triple. But if you use two different ones, you can get uh, some interesting uh, k-homology. Uh, and the operator, what that simply does is that it's an off-diagonal expression, and what it does is that it takes e to the length. Okay, so it's really 
what it's doing is roughly it will be uh, one on the distance to the to the root. And um, I think an, uh, an interesting observation here is that if you were to do logarithmic dampening here, you're just removing the exponential in the expression for this operator D. And this is sort of showing that you, Bellisard and Pearson construct this spectral triple by using that their Hilbert space decomposed in some suitable way, and then they chose eigenvalues of the operator D in that decomposition. If you were to do logarithmically dampening, all that's doing is changing the eigenvalues. So here you have the slightly uh, artificial choice of exponentials. And if you just remove the exponentials, they will give the logarithmically damped operators. I should add here that the reason- uh, Are we to think of this as measuring the difference between the two choice functions? Yeah, that's exactly how to think of this scale logically, yeah. Exactly. The, the existence of choice functions, is that using the axiom of choice? How, how do you know? I, I'm just asking, is that using axiom of choice? Uh, you could. Uh, in general, in short, I don't know. Uh, I can think of examples where you wouldn't need axiom of choice. But, uh, so in some examples, you can explicitly construct uh, choice functions. Yeah, I mean, say it's a regular tree, you, then you can just make a choice saying that, uh, uh, say it's a regular tree where it's, well, I, say it's a regular tree. You still need um, countable choice. Yeah, you need countable choice. You need choice. countable choice. But I guess you would need countable choice to even define this. Uh, it's I a mean, regular tree, so I, I guess it's just a sequence of numbers. Uh, it would amount to a sequence of positive integers, wouldn't it? Oh, bounded, oh. a bounded sequence of positive integers. Yeah. But I mean, if, if you've written this V as sort of the union of all um, Cartesian powers of a finite set, yes. then you could. Uh, you should be able to just say that the choice function is always add. And it takes one of these finite words and it just adds on the first letter infinitely many times. Yes. Uh, not... Yeah, but this means ordering these sets, right? It means ordering these sets, yeah. <laughs> but that sort of appears that... <laughs> but would you really use the axiom of choice to define the choice function then? Maybe so one exists. Some, no, maybe you, one exists. Need, you need some. You need some. You don't need the axiom choice in its full total generality. You need just some special case. Or, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah. Um, what I should add here is that the reason that uh, Bell sort of Pearson chose these exponentials was because then they could define. Uh, they can could reconstruct the measure of the boundary. Uh, Patterson solved the measure on the boundary, given by uh, I mean in terms of zeta function like expressions. But then you could also argue that if you do a logarithmic dampening, you can do exactly the same thing uh, if you don't use the zeta function, but you rather use the heat heat traces instead. And by the way, what is a regular tree? Uh, it's one where it uh, there. Always the same amount of uh, uh -huh. branches Branching. out yeah. from each point. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, what is the summability of this spectral triple? The mm. norm? I think it's basically the Hausdorff dimension. Ah, yeah. of this uh, of this omega, yes. Yeah. That's sort of um, why they were why they use these exponentials because they could reconstruct uh, the uh, something very similar to the Hausdorff measure. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
this ties into uh, construction on Kunz Kruger algebras. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is for a finite graph, and I'll really use the original definition starting from a, a, a finite matrix of zeros and ones. And uh, it's going to be the universal Seastro algebra generated by partial isometries satisfying these uh, Kunz Kruger relations. And uh, it is closely related to a specific rooted tree. And it's just given by uh, the, you take all finite uh, words on the alphabet uh, one, two, three, up to N. Uh, and you only allow the words where uh, A, uh, A of the, of the two subsequent letters is equal to one. And its boundary is the one-sided subshift of finite type. So it's just infinite paths uh, or infinite words uh, where you only allow the words so that A of two subsequent letters is equal to one. So A is the rule that says which words are allowed to say. Okay. And on this uh, one-sided subshift, there's a, a shift map that just forgets the first letter and then reorders them. So it starts from zero. This is a locally expansive map. It's also a local homeomorphism. Okay. And uh, from this local homeomorphism, there's, there's a natural groupoid that arises. It's, you look at triples X and Y, or X and Y are just points in your uh, boundary space, this omega, and N is an integer. And the condition you have on these triples is that <coughs> X and Y will, if you shift them enough times, but you shift X N times more, then they're eventually equal. So this is saying that X and Y, they will be equal after a finite number of steps, but you take N steps more in the X. Okay. This is, uh, so to say they're shift tail equivalent with lag. This is a groupoid over omega and the source and the range maps are simply uh, that X is uh, the range, Y is the source. And the product is that um, in the spatial variables, it behaves like a pair groupoid. And in the end, it's just addition. And there's an explicit isomorphism of this kunz algebra with the group of C's to algebra. And if you look at the C infinity C of this totally disconnected groupoid, by this I mean locally constant, compactly supported functions, it's a totally disconnected space. So the most obvious candidate for smooth functions are locally constant functions. It turns out that under this isomorphism, it corresponds to just uh, polynomials in the generators and their adjoints. Okay. Uh, now there's a very specific map on this groupoid. And what it does is that if you have one of these triples, X and N, Y, it will spit out a positive integer and it will be the smallest K that implements this shift tail equivalence with lag. This is in the topology of the groupoid, it will be a locally constant uh, function and it's therefore continuous. It's bounded from below by uh, zero and by minus N. Okay. And the bound by minus N is simply because N plus K must be positive. Otherwise it doesn't make sense to take a sigma to the power N plus K. K must also be positive because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Sorry, Magnus, can we stop for a while at this uh, statement about um, what are the compactly supported smooth functions? So you say that these are polynomials in these variables as one as n, but should I think about them as, as just really unrestricted polynomials, or do you really mean uh, the Levick path algebra sitting inside this kunz uh, sister algebra? I really mean the Levitz. Okay. Uh, and I notice I am running out of time. Um, okay. You have exactly zero minutes. Okay. Uh, I have exactly zero minutes. Uh, so let's uh, see if we oh, can. Oh, no. That's the most interesting part about Kunz Krieger. Oh, no. <laughs> uh -huh, okay. Uh, 
Okay, I'll, I will abuse. Uh, can I get uh, four more minutes? Oh, yeah, surely. Yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, so this is a, a locally constant function, so it's continuous. And if you, then you can take the group point and you can decompose by the values of, of the n and the values of kappa. And it decomposes the group point into a compact clopen subsets. Okay. And if you, um, what do, this, if you, then, I mean, if you complete uh, the compactly supported continuous functions on this group point as a, as a Hilbert C-star module over the continuous functions on the base, you get some uh, C of omega Hilbert C-star module. And the decomposition of the group void into compact Clopen subsets decomposes this uh, Hilbert C-star module. And it is even a decomposition into finitely generated projective modules. That has to do with the fact that on this compact Clopen G and K, the range in the source maps are both finite to one covers. Uh, from this decomposition, we can define an operator by simply just prescribing the eigenvalues on these uh, summons. Okay? And this is going to look like it's just coming out of nowhere. But on the points where kappa is zero, we set the eigenvalues to just be n. When kappa is zero, then we know that n must automatically be positive. So this is the positive part of the operator. The negative part of the operator is when kappa is not zero. Okay. Then we just say that the eigenvalues is the absolute value of n plus k. So the positive spectral projection is, is of this operator is exactly onto the space where kappa is equal to zero. And if I were to have written up the isomorphism explicitly, one would see that this corresponds to the submodule generated by the polynomials in the generators, not star polynomials, but really just S1 time, I mean, the, the S1 times S2 and different sort of polynomials in, in the generators and not in the attributes. Okay. And roughly because of this, the triple that you get from this, it's not, it's an unbounded Casper module. There's some things to check there. But it, in fact, represents the conspiracy boundary mapping. And this really has to do with the fact that we have prescribed the positive spectrum to lie where kappa is equal to zero, or in other words, on the cell module generated by the, the powers of S. This corresponds to a type of Fock module that you construct this as a conspiracy algebra. And that is more or less by, by Pimston's construction, uh, how you would build the boundary map. So it, it, we built the spectrum in such a way that it fits into um, the boundary map. Okay. Uh, when we, I should maybe mention that it, the construction of the Casper module came a few years before the realization that it was the Kunz-Pimster boundary mapping. Uh, but um, I guess that's history now. It was pure accident that it was the Kunz-Pimster boundary map. But this then will give us a recipe for constructing spectral triples on the Kunz-Krieger algebra from spectral triples on the functions on omega. Okay. Now, this naturally then leads us to the question of how we build spectral triples on the Kunz-Krieger algebra from bellassard pearson spectral triples. Um, this was, a, um, uh, without going into too much detail, let me just say it was a, a wild ride. Uh, because the first peculiarity you see is that when you just naively take the unbounded Casper product, you end uh, the unbounded Casper product, you end up with an operator that is just not possible to show with self adjoint, like with current techniques. It might very well be, but we don't know. Uh, usually, when you prove self adjointness of these things, you need some type of commutative property between the two summons, and it's that commutator is just really, really bad. It's unbounded to. Uh, unprecedented levels. Um, the second peculiarity is that, okay, let's do a logarithmic dampening of the, the Bellasard Pearson. So this was a really nice spectral triple that reproduced geometrically relevant information. We logarithmically dampen it, and now it produces a sensible unbounded Casper product. 
So logarithmic dampening on the Belsart Pearson gave something that could produce a decent Casper product at an unbounded level. At a bounded level, everything of course makes sense, right? This is not a question. Of, this is a question of finding good spectral triples that sort of contain some geometric information. But that Casper product is not going to be an ordinary uh, spectral triple. It's a higher order one. So it will behave, it will satisfy axioms similar to uh, a high order dif elliptic differential operator on a closed manifold. So it does not have bounded commutators. It only has bounded commutators <laughs> relative to some power of itself. So then you can do a logarithmic dampening of the Casper product with the logarithmic dampening. So this double logarithmic dampening does produce a uh, spectral triple. So as I said, this was uh, slightly, uh, this was a bit of a wild ride. Uh, I think I will skip the example in detail for the free group, but there's a way to cook up something there which does uh, have a nice uh, exponential twisting. Um, so there's an explicit construction <coughs> starting from that unbounded Casper product basically by evaluating it in a point of omega. That's a decent k -mology class on a continuous on the continuous functions on a, a compact space. And by localizing that Casper module in a point, it produces a spectral triple uh, such that its phase F has finite rank commutators for the algebra. And we can really control the K-homology classes. It only depends on the first letter in the point of, uh, uh, in the word which you're localizing. And it really spans all of the K-homology. So these are, so sort of anything in K-homology can be represented in this way. And it has an exponential twisting roughly because the commutators with F are finite rank. And it gives you a weakly twisted spectral triple. And if you saturate it in the sense that you look at the algebra generated by all of this alpha. So you look at the algebra generated by the initial algebra, image under alpha, image of alpha under that, and so on and so on. If you look at that. And what do you mean by saturation? I mean that you look at the smallest possible algebra, which is closed under alpha and contains the, the initial. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just this procedure is because I, we want an example, which was an ordinary twist of spectral triple, not weekly, but really a twist of spectral triple where you have an automorphism. That gives you a regular twisted spectral triple. And by regular, I mean this notion of Matassa and Yankin, that there's a twisted pseudo differential calculus, which is a replacement for the ordinary notion of regularity. And here's the freaky part, is that if you pick a fixed point to be that, if you localize in a fixed point, so T is a fixed point, you have discrete dimension spectrum in the sense of twisted spectral triples, but all higher twisted residue co-cycles vanish. So this is killing, uh, any decent hope of um, having a naive type of local index theory for twisted spectral triples because all higher twisted residue cycles cool vanish. So the only one which is non-zero is in degree zero and that will be the KMS state. I'm having problems reading your bullet number two. The okay. classes blah, blah, blah only depend on T zero spans K one. I just don't kind of make out the English. So T, uh, my pen is gone, but T zero is the first letter of this point T that we localize in. I mm -hmm. jumped through some details, but the point is that it really only depends on a finite part of the uh, in of the point we put in, and that we can get any k homology class by these localizations. Uh, ah, okay, okay. So uh, read. So only so depend on t zero comma. Yeah, so there, there's a span. And the span. span. Span, so this yeah. is what confused me. There should yeah. be plural, it's span. The class is span as t zero varies, okay. Yeah. Because I read it as t, t zero spans, you know, because of the spans I read t zero spans didn't make sense to me. Okay, I've got it now, okay. Yeah, sorry. As the set be. of classes. Yeah. The set of classes, they span. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I'm way over time, which I'm sorry about, but I will nevertheless ask 
these questions uh, because I think they're, they're quite interesting. And um, I think it would be interesting to ask for an, a sort of a, a, some type of efficient method for local index theory of exponentially summable structure traces. So to use heat traces instead of, um, instead of zeta functions. So the heat traces, they localize in the same way that zeta functions would. And if one could do something like that, it would also produce a local index theory for twisted spectral triples. So there's no real obvious answer to that uh, that I've seen because uh, of the example above where you really have uh, um, that sort of uh, naively defined twisted residue cycles cycles are zero. And uh, another question that I think is interesting is that uh, these twisted spectral triples was a way out of cons obstruction to finite some ability for spectral triples that you sort of, you had um, an obstruction to finite some ability of spectral triples because of traces. So then you look at twisted traces, then you would get twisted spectral triples. But is there anything similar, an obstruction to finite some ability of bounded fret modules? There are very few examples of, of, uh, of um, algebras that admit no, or that there are very few examples of k-mology classes that do not admit finitely symbol representatives as spread modules. There's no real obstruction. Happening. So with that, I thank you all for your attention and apologize for going way over time. Thank you very much. So we can all virtually clap hands. Now the situation is reversed. Usually the audience asks questions to the speaker, but now it was the other way around. The now you answer asks... my question. <laughs> yes, uh, the speaker asks, asks questions, but if there are any further questions or remarks or comments, please fire at will. Well, the Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that the, the great advantage of the finite summability of um, a spectral triple is you can then quite explicitly read out from the spectral triple a cyclic cohomology class. What happens with the twisted? Uh, if you don't have summability, it seems to me there's a problem with that. So. What happens with these twisted spectral triples? Can you read out a, explicitly, read out a cyclic cohomology class? Uh, it's sort of, uh, it's actually built in for very, uh, well, let me just find the right slide. It, it's sort of built in um, here. So uh, the cyclic co-cycle you get from a finitely summable spectral triple really comes from the F. Yes. And if a twisted spectral triple is Lipschitz regular and finitely summable, you still have finitely summable commutators with F. So it's sort of, it, it really is the same definition of a cyclic co-cycle if you use this contrarian character starting from that operator F. Uh -huh. And now might also be a good point to say that uh, there's no general uh, property of twisted spectral triples beyond Lipschitz regularity that allows you to define a K-mology class from a twisted spectral triple. So Lipschitz regularity is in a, it's, it, it has a distinguished role if you want to talk about K-mology of twisted spectral triples. Th there's a very nice definition of Jens, Jens Card that, uh, gives an alternative condition allowing for uh, defining a chemology class. Um, and it's alternative, it means it's neither stronger nor weaker, right? Yeah, because it doesn't cover all twisted spectral triples. It, it mm -hmm. assumes uh, that the twist is of a special form. It's mm -hmm. fairly general, but it's, it's, uh, it's sort of defined relative to an auxiliary operator. Well, a K-homology class, I mean, that's great. Um, 
but I think it's two distinct issues that that is a chaomology class and a cyclic co-cycle. I think yeah. these are yeah. two distinct issues. Definitely. It just so happens that the condition used to ensure uh, um, the condition used to ensure that there is a chemology class is exactly what you need beyond finite summability to define a cyclic co cycle. Uh -huh. uh, that, that's sort of what I meant that it Lipschitz regularity is a natural condition as, as it ensures existence of a chemology class. And under that, you only need finite summability to define a cyclic co cycle. Anybody else? Well, I, I want to thank the speaker for something that he did. He, in a paper, I was invited to submit a paper for the special edition of the Oxford Quarterly Journal in honor of Sir Michael Atiyah, who alas is no longer with us. So my coworker Eric Van Erp and I submitted a paper about the index of Toplitz operators for this special uh, edition. So we thought the paper was wonderful and, uh, as usual and so on and so on. But the speaker found a huge mistake in the paper. And I wanna thank the speaker for this. Thank you for finding this. It was a very serious mistake in the paper. However, we corrected the mistake. And I believe that the, pub the published version of the paper, I think it has appeared, I believe it is correct. So I thank the speaker for finding this very serious mistake in our paper. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it, it, it is a wonderful paper and uh, the fix was really beautiful. I, I, I had some ideas, but they were not, uh, they were very cumbersome and comparison. <laughs> yeah. Well, we did, we did find a fix. Yeah, it was a very nice fix. Thank you for a wonderful paper. Great. It's Sounds like a good story. Um, any further questions or comments? Excuse me. So um, if I understood it correctly, uh, if you started with this uh, assumption of uh, regularity, uh, you can perform this uh, construction of dampening and you, get, uh, you end up uh, with something which is uh, exponentially summable. So in this context, it is uh, possible maybe to uh, to give a definition uh, to to construct a churn character, but uh, but which is uh, not uh, anymore in uh, ordinary cyclic uh, cohomology, but it is in uh, the entire theory. Yeah. So so uh, how this uh, relates to the situation if you uh, perform this uh, construction without the dampening, and you just uh, consider the the twisted version of the uh, churn character for a for a, a ordinary cyclic theory. Okay, it would be natural to guess that they coincide, um, but I don't know anything uh, concrete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I mean that they code can be identified uh, under suitable maps. It seems like a natural guess, but I have um, not worked on any details for this, no. Uh, but yeah, that's actually a natural question. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I will think about that. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Tomek or Tomek? Maybe one question about the role of Fox space in the proof of this theorem with Meslant and Rainey about this um, boundary map. 
Yeah. If you could come. Yes, yes, precisely. What, what is the role of the Fox space here? Uh, the role of the Fox space is that uh, the boundary map in the Kunz-Pimsner sequence is coming from an extension of OA by C of omega A compact operators on the Fox module. Oh, I see. And um, the extension is really somehow that you do a sort of a toplets quantization of elements of O of A on that Fock module. Um, so mm -hmm. the Fock module, you can think of it as having some kind of uh, generating set given by all polynomials in S, S1 up to Sn. So no stars, just S. But then it's, of course, it's a module over C of omega A. So they, the sort of certain stars can appear because C of omega A can be thought of as, um, I mean, as a subalgebra of the Kuntz-Kruig algebra. Um, and then the way you would quantize the generator S1 as kind of a topless operator on this Fock module is really as multiplication by, by, by that SI on a polynomial in SI. Uh, it's not going to be a representation of the consecrated algebra because the adjoint is not what you expect. It's not, the adjoint is not going to be multiplication by SI star simply because SI star doesn't make sense when you multiply on the left. So there's a projection showing up in that. Um, and the, the, the crucial kind of feature that is entering here is that this way of quantizing the generators of the Kuntz-Kruger algebra is, is multiplicative up to finite rank in a certain sense. Um, that multiplication by SI star is not, uh, is in a sense, it's actually the adjoint of that toplets operator except on a finite rank module. So the quantization is, is sort of multiplicative up to, um, up to finite rank operators. And that actually shows up later because that's how one shows finite rank commutators with the F, turns out, uh, by some algebraic tricks. But uh, yeah, so, so it, it all comes from the extension picture. And then you, you simply want to find a representation of OA on some Hilbert module and then uh, an unbounded self-adjoint regular operator with compact resolvent whose positive spectral projection is more or less the Fock module. And once, once you have that, it will be the uh, represent the boundary map. So it, it's a really loose bill to fit. Like there's not much you need to require. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Since you are here, could you go just one uh, slide backward? Okay, this is what I'm doing. Okay, so these are all mu's in this power, such that, okay. Okay, I wanted to, to recall this one-sided subshift. Okay, good. Tomek, are you happy? Uh, maybe one question, more question. Um, you started from this uh, example of a circle acted on by a subgroup of SU11. So this lo looks like um, like uh, you have some. Um, it's, in fact, it's a RP one, which is acted on by some subgroup of projective linear transformations, and and this um, commutator or twisted commutator, this twist of the commutator uh, makes makes D an operator on functions taking values in uh, modular functions or modular forms of, of weight uh, plus minus one. I don't remember what, what, what this weight. So it's a very, very beautiful geometric picture related to modular forms. If you are using this dampening, uh, what part of this information about this relation with modular forms survives? I 
I'm not sure I even understand the question. Um, uh, so you're saying that the, you want to view the functions on the circle as modular forms on... No, no, no. I'm, I'm treating this uh, circle as RP1, mm -hmm. acted on by fractional linear transformations. Okay, and then this twist alpha uh, means that uh, D is not an op op operator on A, on, on, sorry, on, on these algebra functions. It is an operator from these algebra functions to sections of a real Hopfline bundle. So over RP1? Yes. So D uh, becomes not an uh, endomorphism, it, it becomes an amorphism between two different spaces. So, so, so this uh, twist of alpha means precisely this uh, transformation by the square root of, of, the, um, of, of, of the derivative. Okay, so this means that it's a modular function of uh, weight uh, probably one, okay? So, so, so D looks like, uh, like an, an operator between um, differently weighted um, modular forms. Therefore, you are talking not about a commutator, but uh, you have to twist this commutator and speak about a twisted commutator. Okay? All right. Uh, but, but everything depends uh, on, on this identity identification with modular forms. So, so this picture is very nice from many uh, perspectives like, like uh, arithmetics uh, or number theory. Uh, I, I am interested uh, if you, if you uh, dampen this, this, this um, picture, what arithmetic dif information could survive You, you have you have the same you said the, have the same k homology class, but on on the side of this uh, uh, initial undamped uh, undamped um, operator d, you have uh, maybe some interpretation of 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 this of this k homology class in terms of arithmetic. Uh, what hap what what happens uh, after passing to to the to this different uh, dampened? Uh, realization of the same k homology class. Yeah, I um, I think I understand the question, but I just can't make sense of it now. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think so. One issue that uh, I see is that if you view D as an operator between different spaces, um, it it's not self adjoint anymore. Yes. Uh, and that uh, is somehow, uh, I mean, it, it's formally a quite serious problem because how do you define the absolute value? <laughs> yes. uh, so I, I just don't know how to make sense of the question. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I think to answer the, the question, one we need to make... Uh, so even even if D is an operator between two different modules, yeah, still you can you can speak about it's a joint. Yeah. So you can compose with it a joint. You can take the square root. So everything makes sense. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you. Yeah, but it sort of will have. It will, there will, there's some piece missing. Is what I mean. I mean, of course, this will. You can, uh, if you have between different modules, you can take an adjoint and then you can try to put it in a two by two matrix and you will have a self adjoint thing and you can do logarithmic dampening on that. Uh, but then I'm not really sure where this would go. Um, I, I would imagine that if you do this two by two trick, uh, I guess that somewhere along the way you would use that there's some identification between the two modules that just doesn't respect all the structures and that's where the twist is needed 
Um, mm -hmm. I would expect that it's sort of, uh, I don't know, it, it should come back. And, it, I mean, this the, that identification seems to be where, where, where things happened somehow and that uh, so this twist is it's a price paid for this identification it, it seems like that from what you're describing and then it should somehow be that this identification is not compatible with with d in some way uh, even though it's compatible with the algebra action and then uh, somehow logarithmically dampening might uh play nicer with the identification is, is a wild speculation. I, I don't really know what I'm talking about here. Uh, uh, it, I mean, this logarithmic dampening is a really cheap trick. It, it It's really just using the fact that logarithm transforms multiplication into, um, into addition. It's sort of that a rescaling of some form will not be visible after you take the logarithm and a twist is really some form of rescaling. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a really cheap trick. Uh, so I'm, I would be mildly skeptic toward it containing mm -hmm. any deep implications uh, outside of NCG. Okay. It, it, it just seemed. Uh, I think what I'm saying is that it's, it's not really a deep kind of result. So it would be, I would, uh, I would be amazed if it had deep consequences. Okay. Okay. Thank I you. think this was a very thorough response. Anybody else? I don't see any raised hands. So uh, let us thank our speaker again. We choose reaction clapping hand. Here you go. And before I stop recording, uh, let me also thank the audience for participating and uh, asking questions. Of course, thank Magnus for a very nicely paced talk. Uh, I really liked the way you delivered this talk. This was somehow very nice to follow. I appreciate it. And let me advertise that for if next week we move from Sweden to Arizona. So I, we didn't plan it. It was not done on purpose, believe me, but somehow we are jumping across the ocean every week. So we moved from California to Sweden and now from Sweden to Arizona. So it's back and forth. Uh, it was a title of a movie, back and forth or something with hobbits. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, thank you again very much, uh, all of you, and I hope to see you in a week. It will be Jack Spielberg. I don't know the abstract and title yet, but it might well be some graph sister algebras. Okay, I stop recording. Thank you very much. See you in a week. Bye-bye. Thank you.